Greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever you are in this beautiful world. Tonight, I have an exceptional guest for this special episode, a truly enlightened soul, Masami uh, Sato, the co-founder, the second co-founder of B1G1. I've been blessed to have the first co-founder, Mr. Paul Dunn, in September on my podcast, and I knew that I had to, to bring as well the other co-founder because I just love your story, what you're doing. We're going to unpack all of that. So it's my honor. I love what you guys have been doing, um, impacting over almost over 250 million people since uh, you started in 2007. And I love the way when I had Paul on the podcast, how you guys started this. Just one question, one question. And I strongly believe in the power of questions. You ask them one question. What would happen if every time business happens, something good happens? That was a question that changed his life and changed the lives of almost a quarter of a million people. So we're going to talk about all of that. And I love what you're doing with B1G1, which is creating a world of giving and the power of small. So without any further ado, Masami, welcome to the show, my dear friend. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. But pleasure's on mine. So, be- so as I told you just before I'm going live, the type of conversation I like to have is to see that, to have a heart to heart conversation, get to know the person. So for people who don't know you, who's Masami as a person? Um. <laughs> A <laughs> good question. Well, uh, how do I describe? Um, I'm just, you know, a very simple person, and uh, I learned. I'm an entrepreneur. I love business, and I love the creativity and, you know, innovative thinking behind all the businesses. Um, so that's why I'm doing what I do today. But I come from a very humble background. Um, I was born in Japan and grew up as an extremely shy, uh, quiet child. Um, I love to spend the time in nature, but I didn't know how to make friends. And that's probably because, you know, my dad, who used to work for a large um, corporation in Japan, he was transferred to uh, many parts of Japan um, when I was growing up. So that meant that then I had to change schools like uh, sometimes. And that was very, very difficult for me because I already didn't know how to make friends, but I had to, you know, go to another place as a stranger. So um, with that I was very shy and I was kind of like afraid of a lot of things like uh, hurting people's feelings or you know saying something wrongly or um, so that was me so for somebody like that to be now living uh, in different you know countries and traveled a lot and then now I'm running an organization that works with uh, businesses and also non-profit organizations around the world that's pretty amazing but I can tell you that I'm still the same very simple person <laughs> who sometimes feels very small <laughs> I love that I love that we're gonna talk about uh, that in a moment but now tell us what makes you happy as a person oh um very simple things actually like I'm, I like to enjoy just very simple things like just running you know like I love running or mm-hmm. walking um, I love playing sports like I love playing tennis I love being creative cooking food with my daughter or um, but the um, actually the thing that makes me the happiest is when I see the goodness in others you know when people actually like come together to try to do something that is beyond their own personal gain you know for, for their own personal gain or needs and when that like connection uh, really created the magic you know that, that's when I really feel the happiest <laughs> love that love that now what makes you on the other hand what makes you sad and angry oh um I <laughs> I don't tend to get angry um and sadness yes of course sometimes like i sometimes like feel lonely like when i'm alone or uh but um uh maybe like so that that feelings of sadness or anger or frustration those things i kind of overcome pretty quickly because what I realized, especially like through the time of traveling uh, around the world, because, you know, I used to be the person who was so afraid not, not to offend anybody. And as a result, I didn't talk. But then what happened was when I 
was backpacking and I had very little money too. So I was getting by in kind of quite unique ways, <laughs> sometimes staying in people's homes or oh, hitchhiking. Wow. Or, so that was kind of me. So in being so vulnerable and then plus I couldn't speak English like when I left Japan. <laughs> so oh. I had to start communicating with people in a brand new way. Like, you know, you speak six languages or something, but you know, like uh, when you lose the ability to speak in the language that people speak in, then only thing you could do is to really surrender and let go, you know, even though you can learn, but it takes time. So through the simple interaction and the connection and just being vulnerable and okay to be vulnerable, okay to ask for help or okay to be very simple <laughs> in the expressions, I learned that actually the world wasn't such a scary place. And then also people everywhere always um, helped me whenever I really needed to help needed help so um so I, with that those experiences i think i pretty quickly overcame the um negative feelings that come up when you are in many different situations and then also um even though we might get frustrated or angry about something when we actually just try to understand or listen to the person or you know eventually discover why this person was so upset because of the certain circumstances we didn't understand then we you realize that you know it, it, there was no point of being so angry or attached to it <laughs> so mm -hmm. letting go is like one of the things that i would do quite quickly <laughs> absolutely that's a perfect segue now speaking of that what would you say is your personal superpower oh superpower um to be able to smile at challenging things wow. as well maybe <laughs> love that now you like traveling right yes uh i do i i used to do a lot these days i actually don't seek like the excitement of traveling much anymore <laughs> but let me, yeah let me take you on a different type of travel now down okay. memory line remember when when you were a kid when you when we were your kids people family friends parents teachers ask us so mm. Sammy, what do you want to become when you grow up so go back mm. to when you were a young girl mm -hmm. when people mm -hmm. ask you that question what was your answer back then mm. I, I had two and one was scientist Wow. Everybody thought I was kind of maybe crazy. <laughs> um, and then another one was I wanted to become like a, a person who lives on the island alone, you know, like with Whoa. no other human beings, <laughs> just live with animals or then build my own nice. place or something. So it was very different, two different things. <laughs> Now you live on an island, but I think there's quite a few people on your island with you, right, in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Awesome. Now, when you were a young girl in school, what was your favorite subject in school? Oh, I think it's changed probably quite a lot, like throughout mm -hmm. my schooling. But I did like, uh, you know, math or science, like. Uh, initially. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I also liked the problem solving aspect of like physics or, you know, so that, that mm -hmm. was more me. Like I wasn't really into languages. Uh, okay. you know, arts, yeah, I was into creativity and problem solving. Uh, but um, I, I really hated English actually <laughs> when I was <laughs> studying in the classroom. Why? Was it because of the teacher or because the Oh, the teacher was probably one part of it, but oh, wow. okay. for me, like, for me, there was no application, like, mm -hmm. because we were all living in Japan, nobody yes. existed in my hometown who spoke English. So why, why are we studying this, like, you know, when we didn't use mm -hmm. in any way. So for me, like, it was pretty useless back then. So I only learned very like in a hard way when I was uh, uh, actually out of Japan. <laughs> so now let's go to that. For example, you said you come from a, a small town in Japan where nobody spoke English, and then mm. you started traveling around the world. Mm -hmm. mm. What caused you to go travel the world? Because I was curious. Mm. So that curiosity was one thing. It was always driving me. So even though I didn't necessarily talk a lot about my thoughts. I had a lot of thoughts in my head. 
and I would usually talk to myself or talk to like animals or insects or oh, wow. so my world was pretty entertaining and amazing because I was yeah like if you just look in zoom in like uh, looking at the insect and just following their behavior and and feeling that, that you could just like feel connected mm -hmm. to them you could talk with them or connect with them like so the I, I was never bored, <laughs> even oh, when yes. I didn't really interact with kids at my age. Um, yeah. <laughs> that must have been quite a journey. Wow, amazing. Speaking of that, let's talk about your path. From the moment you left school to now, how would you describe your path? Would you say it was pretty straightforward or was it, you know, turns and twists, ups and down, like, like a roller coaster? So tell us, tell us about your path from the moment you left school to now. So um, I feel like the um, time I was in Japan and going through mm -hmm. school, that time was more emotionally like difficult and you know in some way a little bit traumatic because I grew up thinking that I couldn't fit in you know partly because I was like moving into new school and I spoke with a different accent you know from other kids living in oh, that wow. region or yeah so that happened and also I happened to be bullied and you know but I think that's part of all part of experience and mm -hmm. And then also my parents were really busy and they were really not at home much. And my dad, you know, was under stress. And so being in that environment, I felt pretty insecure and I felt disconnected from the world around me. So that was my childhood. So it's not like any major catastrophe happened, but inside I was really suffering at that time. And so when I left Japan, Physically, I actually had so much more upside and downs. Like, so for example, when I was in Costa Rica one day and you know, my Spanish was pretty basic at that time. And I found myself like landing in San Jose uh, that I actually had access to no money. Um, so my card I was using <laughs> when I was traveling, wow. couldn't give me any money from the local ATM machine. <laughs> and wow. I had just like a few US dollars in my pocket. And I knew nobody. And, you know, like, wow. so, <laughs> so things like that happened and, and quite a lot as well. But um, I, the, through those experiences, I always found that in the end, I had the most amazing experiences when I let go and surrender to the situation. So crazy things happened a lot in the last, like, 25 years or so, which is like almost half of my life. So the first half was, you know, uh, physically not so ch not that challenging, but emotionally very challenging. And mm -hmm. second part was physically probably very challenging <laughs> if you look at the cases of what actually happened, but mm -hmm. emotionally quite straightforward. <laughs> awesome, love that. Now that's a we're gonna talk about that now. So I'm sure you heard this the saying that says, "Change your story, change your life." So when you must me at the change your story, like you were saying, I don't belong here. I don't want to fit in here. Mm. How, what, how did you change the story that you were telling yourself in your mind to change your life or to bring your life to where you wanted to? Do? How did you do it? Do, did you do it through the help of friends, families, uh, mentors, books? Mm. So tell us the process that you used to, to change your story, to change your life. Ah, um, so for me, it took time to get there. It's not like right. a, an instant enlightenment or something yeah. like to yeah. realize something. So, so I, I think it's easy to, you know, write a book and to try to convey like this is the technique you can use or something. Mm -hmm. But I think for us physically to, you know, go through our own transformation, sometimes it takes time. It takes experiences, not just reading or listening or knowing. Sure. But I think the uh, metaphor that I remind myself of helps a lot, you know, in this. Like when I start to feel a little bit attached to something, then I use the metaphor to remind myself. And that metaphor I use is that um, uh, it's a game. And um, it's a game because um, when you imagine like playing, playing a board game with others, then what happened in the game is that there is a beginning of the game and end of the game. And then there are other game players in the game. There are rules that you need to understand and then go with. And there are sometimes lucky moments and unlucky moments. 
and you keep moving forward or backward or steal the point or gain the point. So you have all these things happening in the game. But then what ultimately you realize in the game is that the purpose of the game is to enjoy. And so in life and in business and everything we do, you know, we don't necessarily like uh, undervalue this experience as well, just a game. So that's not what the metaphor is about, but we all go through the beginning and the end, whether it's life or business or mm -hmm. everything. So if we just really appreciate the opportunity that we get to play, then the most important thing we have is just to go with it and learn as much as we can get better game players, but make sure that others are really enjoying, you know, together with us. And it's a game. Sure. We don't need to get attached to every single thing that happened. Absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of that game, what made you understand that? Was that a specific event or moment mm. or was that something that you started to understand progressively over the years? Maybe like multiple incidences or, yeah. you know, something that happened. Like, so when you go through some extreme situation and then mm. you manage to step back, Right? Like, so that, oh, no money in Costa Rica. You don't, you know, <laughs> what do you do? What, what do you do? And or a certain accident or, you know, life-changing kind of mm -hmm. like moments. Then um, all of those moments, what I realized was that it actually wasn't about me. Mm. You know, I'm just this like a piece of, uh, you know, in the game that I somehow consciously get to move. Right, use this piece to like a, like a puppet <laughs> to wow. do the things and this puppet has certain characteristics like I'm short and you know I'm Japanese and I can't change those things that's given condition but um, you will kind of you try to utilize this piece to do something that is great and makes the game more fun and uh, also expansive and you know uh, let everybody have a great time together. So when you feel less attached and then you no longer feel very bad about yourself because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not about you. And if I look at somebody else, I don't necessarily judge the person for being too short or too this or something Absolutely. like that. Yeah. So in the same way, I will keep distance from myself. And then, so I don't mind something that's not perfect. But at the same time, uh, when I feel you know, great about something that happened. I also remind myself that it's not about you either. <laughs> so that good thing happened, but good thing happened because of all of the, you know, pieces of puzzles playing this together. And so it doesn't like make you want to get greater recognition. <laughs> totally, totally. I totally agree with you. It's a it's a game that with we have to play, and also it's a game that not only to be enjoyed but also for us to to learn lessons. Speaking mm -hmm. of lesson, what would you say has been so far the biggest lesson you've learned in this game that we call life so far? Mm, biggest lesson mm, that that's tricky. Um, I think uh, maybe Sometimes you know similar thing like. Mm -hmm. as the lesson in the game, you know, it, knowing that it's okay. It's going to work out in the way, like, because it, what happened is it's easy to look back and go, wow, like all these things, you know, all the dots connected together now for me to be where I am today, right? But it's hard to look forward to try to do that same thing. Mm -hmm. So that's why we always feel uncertain about where we are going and we have a sense of doubt or fear you know about where we are heading to because we cannot predict it but the thing is if we just know this bit of okay in the future one day you will be standing in another path along the journey then you look back and then you go oh all the dots connected <laughs> yes so <laughs> love that absolutely now you mentioned that you're an entrepreneur what was the first business that you started uh, my first business, actually, like very, very first business I got involved in was my grandparents' business. And so they were, um, they had a family business in Tokyo. And because my parents were very busy, so I spent most of the childhood always helping my grandparents run this family business, which was like a little corner store in the neighborhood in Tokyo. Um, so they sold like all sorts of things, you know, from food to um, household items. 
So from the age of probably like two or three years old, I was oh, wow. sweeping the floor or serving the customers or filling the shelves or counting the money at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. I did that. And that kind of made me be um, probably okay with the idea of being an entrepreneur and not having a job. <laughs> yes. And yeah, but then um, when I started to travel, I really got into food, the world of food, because um, to me, like uh, when I lost my language, I didn't know how to connect with people through words. But I discovered that if I could connect with people through food, mm. I could connect with anybody anywhere around the world. So I became very into food and I cooked everywhere I went. And then as a result, people will often say, oh, why don't you come and stay with us? And you can stay with us forever because <laughs> you can cook or, you know, like you do exchange so work. Were you cooking or... Japanese food for them or local food or? Maybe like mixture, um, wow. you know, international, like mixing all mm -hmm. sort of ingredients together. Or... So that's why when I started my very first business 20 years ago, it naturally was a food business because I was passionate about food. Mm, so that was the first one. <laughs> Beautiful. Now, so how did that mm. lead to... Uh, mm. Now, let's talk about B1G1, the origins of B1G1. So when I talked with Mr. Paul about two months ago, he mm. said that he had a conversation with you at the time you were mentoring him, and he asked one question. What, what would happen if, for example, if someone were to buy a, a TV something good would happen and and they said of course not we're not going to give him a free tv because that's happen. but instead we're going to give him uh, able access to uh, to uh to to vision if someone buys a book gets uh, gets uh, gets access to books and if someone buys a cup of coffee access to clean water so that's beautiful now how did you get this idea what gave you this idea of building a business that would do good each time business were done what was the origin of that so um, when I started my business, I didn't start the business trying to get like good income or you know to create my own wealth or something like that. But the reason um, why I started a business was because I wanted to be in charge of how I used my life to do something meaningful. And when I was um, traveling again, I, um, at that time, I saw actually many things that really didn't make sense to me. And I told you that I was very curious. So I always tried to figure out why certain things were happening. But there were things I couldn't understand why they were happening. Because, for example, if like young children couldn't go to school and to complete the primary school education, that didn't make sense to me. Because if young children were begging on the street or sleeping on the street in the cold night in Japan, in my own country, definitely there would be some help for them, right? Like we wouldn't leave a young child sleeping in a cold night on the street. But the thing is, in so many countries I visited, those things existed and there was no help. And so to me, that just didn't make sense to me. And but I was this tiny little person and backpacker with little money, so I couldn't fix these problems, but that stayed with me. So when I became a mom, um, and my daughter is 20 years old today, but when she was wow. born, I felt this like profound sense of connection with this little tiny thing because, you know, to her, like I was everything, right? Like, so I um, was committed to do everything I could to make sure she grows up um, healthy and happy. And I think every parent feels like this, but some parents may not have the ability to even provide for their own kids. So I thought that um, even though, you know, I would do anything for my own daughter, then, but what about other kids? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do something, even though I couldn't fix all the problem in the world, but I thought I would do just a little bit, bit more than taking care of, just taking care of my own family. So that's how, um, I started to the business. And mm -hmm. so the ultimate aim of business was always to give 100% of profit <laughs> and to help feed and educate, you know, children, underprivileged children. So that was the kind of mission of the business from day one. 
But then what happened was because we had very little capital, we were struggling initially, but eventually this business developed. And then uh, back in Australia at that time, the company became a frozen packaged meal business. So we had um, packaged uh, frozen, uh, sorry, <laughs> organic and gluten-free meals that we were distributing to other retail stores. So at one point of time, we had over 150 stores selling our products in three different states in Australia. And wow. even at that time, I realized one day that we weren't doing anything you know, five years after we started, because we were putting all the money back into business, saying we need new freezer room, or this thing is broken, like we need to fix that, or we need a new packaging, better marketing, and so on, so on, never ending. So I paused at that time, and then thought to myself that if I kept telling the same story to myself that we were not ready yet, to do something great, then we would probably keep going. And maybe 10 years time, 20 years time, we will still be doing the same thing. So that's the moment where the idea of B1J1 landed, you know, and then we thought, I thought, what if every time we sell a, one packet of meal, we would help provide a meal to a child. And wow. we figured out how that will happen, you know, working with experienced NGO, and then we realized it cost uh, 25 cents at that time. And then we thought, oh, we could do this. You know, we don't need to wait. <laughs> and Amazing. yeah, then eventually that turned into the idea of like, imagine if it wasn't just for our own food company, but if every business could find their own unique ways to contribute to the world. And then I pitched the idea to Paul and so that's the beginning. And we sold uh, my food company and moved to Singapore to start the B1J1 as the global giving initiative. So that wow. was 2007. <laughs> Amazing. So when you first, before even starting B1J1, when you first started sharing this idea with other people, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. were their reaction? Um, I think that, you know, when we didn't have anything, like, because we had this idea, but we didn't know how to make it work. You know? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so that idea itself actually resonated with people so much. So we had at, at that time, this uh, video, very simple video with a black screen and text to floating with John Lennon's Imagine music wow. in the background. And, you know, imagine if every time you have a coffee or you dine out, a child receives the access to a meal. Imagine if every time you um, read a book, purchase a book, a tree gets planted. Imagine if every time you go to see a doctor, a child receives wow. access to healthcare. And you know, that world of B1J wines is still there. We still have word imagine on our landing page on the website because it started with this like hope and idea, like believing that businesses and um, people around the world could come together to really transform big issues in the world. And that like premise is there. And we are so uh, grateful for the thousands of businesses that have joined us along the way and have mm -hmm. created um, over 260 million giving impacts wow. to date. So when you, that's beautiful. Now, moving forward, when you started mm -hmm. sharing the idea with Mr. Paul, was it easy to convince him? <laughs> no, because, you know, his mistake, like misunderstanding about like every time, uh, let's say imagination wise, every time yeah. somebody purchase a plasma TV and then he thinks like, oh, why, how do we give a plasma TV away? <laughs> so that is a misconception even today too, because mm -hmm. um, when we talk about the B1J1, then some people go immediately to, oh, that's like uh, one for one, like Tom's shoes. Um, yes. Right. So I think the world most known, like one for one business yes. model started mm -hmm. with Tom's and Tom's started roughly around the same time as B1J1. Yes. We didn't know them, but um, because people thought the one for one was about giving the company's product away. That's why, you know, if like ice cream shop, 
you want to give back, do they give another ice cream away? And, yeah. and the business product and services, of course, like some businesses might uh, decide to contribute or donate a part of their product or part of their expertise and service to other NGOs or you know, good causes too. But that generally speaking, um, what we need to change to create a real impact in the world may not necessarily directly relate to the product and services businesses are offering. So we wonder what model is actually very different because it's really about imagining all the business activities, not mm-hmm. even just the sales activities, but it could be like every Zoom me- meeting we have, you know, nice conversation we have. We can actually celebrate that by planting a tree in the world or, you mm-hmm. know, uh, giving a, a micro loan to a woman to start a business. So there are so many things we can look at the doing to make our day-to-day business activities, connection and engagement much more meaningful. But at the same time, we need to always remember that it's not about what we want. You know, it's about mm-hmm. how things can create a real impact. And we work with experienced um, NGO partners around the world who actually have trialed many approaches and figured out the ways to bring change, positive change into communities. Then we work with them to identify and break down those programs into micro unit of impact so that it becomes easy for every business to think about embedding giving. Awesome, love that. Now, from the moment that you add this idea first, Mm -hmm. how long did it take from that moment until it actually was born and actually was starting doing good? Uh, I'm sure it it was doing good from the beginning too, because if one business was giving Mm. to certain causes to us. What I mean mean is from the moment you had the idea, how long did it take Mm. before you were able to convince the first company? Oh, not too long. Oh, wow. (laughs) Because because in the beginning, we didn't have a smart system or a uh, mm-hmm. initiative. So what we did was we are looking for businesses that believe in this mission to help create this together. So that was like an invitation to unknown things, you know, as partners uh, for change, right? Like, and then uh, some businesses say, yeah, like, I love the idea. We want to be part of making that happen. And then they became our friends, advisors, and mm-hmm. all that too. So in the beginning, we were figuring out, you know, it took yeah. about three years for b one to have a proper business model that can actually like continuously onboard the businesses to, you know, come to work with us and then implement the giving. But even at that time, our system wasn't that sophisticated and we were still, you know, learning about uh, how to bring in the right project to work with us and, you know, all that kind of thing. So it took quite a long time for us to be able to say, okay, we tackled this like model. And today we are coming to a point where we know fundamentally like how to facilitate this, but we are starting to see much more insight and learning in our data and understanding the optimization of how the uh, giving coming from so many businesses can be distributed in a you know, good way to the causes around the world as well. So the work would never probably be complete or <laughs> perfect, wow. but we keep going. What was the first company that joined B1G1? Do you remember? Mm, I think some of the few, like I remember really well, like as the, what was the very B1G1. first one. The very first one. Very fast? No, there was no very fast because there were probably like 10 that joined oh, at the same wow. time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, I can remember, let, let's say this um, art gallery in Thailand. You know, every Beautiful. time they sell a painting, you, they provide a month support to a blind person uh, to um, go through occupational training. So they would be able to do computer, you know, uh, coding, uh, engineering, uh, and and things like that. And you know, um, they stayed with us uh, and they gave every single month, like you know, for the number of painting mm-hmm. they sold. And wow. only that when the owner retired from the work, and you know, finally decided to also close down the art gallery. He closed down the b one to one account, but you know, he told me how meaningful it was to have that integrated in the journey of his business. And so um, it's really about giving stories. Like it's not just about donations going to charities, but totally. weaving the yeah, uh, stories of businesses with um, also stories of 
lives around the world that we could actually you know participate to improve together absolutely for me what took me i mean as i told you i was always wanted to do something that, to help but when the one thing that really sparked the idea for me was actually tom's shoes last year i, I love reading i love listening to podcasts i just came up mm. across one of his episodes he was talking and i said i have to do this so i started doing last year to launch a product on e-commerce on a crowdfunding platform called kickstarter mm. uh, my goal was not to raise any specific amount of money my goal was for example for each unit i would sell i would donate a pair of eyeglasses to someone in need mm. in india so my goal was to to raise enough money so i can give one pair of eyeglasses to five thousand people mm. in need around india but unfortunately, because of the pandemic and everything happening, manufacturing was affected badly around the world. I couldn't find anyone to make it. But now, on the business I'm building now, for uh, helping uh, art-centered entrepreneurs to to find their, their voice through podcasting, for every client that I will start, uh, you know, I will start uh, helping. I will be uh, sponsoring a year of education for a child in India. To, uh, and I would love to do that to uh, either that or something to do with, with eyeglasses through B1G1. So that's something mm. that we can talk after because for me, doing good is something that's fundamental, that's part of my being, that's part of what this podcast is about, is about inspiring entrepreneurs to do good. So yeah, I'm really happy to connect with you. So that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so I um, uh, think, you know, that that, there is a uh, important learning for me, like when I was running my own business, because the moment I realized that um, if I kept postponing, like trying to do big thing, because it's easy to try to do like really big thing, but the big thing is sometimes difficult to get started with. But if we start with small things first and then make it part of it, um, uh, part of our daily experiences mm -hmm. then that joy of giving can be always part of our journey so totally. that's why like we talk about um uh, three things impact habit and connection so if we can bring impact habit and connection into the world of business and giving then we, we can do so much good because businesses are always out there they are already serving customers doing what they do so if we can incorporate the good you know, that they could do inside of the business activities so that that can also create a social impact and improvement. And those things can come together to solve our global issues. Then we really can drive change. But when we don't do it and just do like expect ad hoc thing to change the world for us, then it's not going to change. We need to change our habit. So, um, totally. yeah. What can we do to, uh, to encourage more and more businesses and people to, to uh, implement the giving back, the doing good into their businesses. Do you have any tips on that for businesses that mm -hmm. are watching? I think this? Uh, compared to 10, you know, 14 years ago when we started, the awareness is already here. Mm -hmm. So businesses, I, I think today are thinking that they do want to do good things, you know, because we also realized uh, along the way in our business journey that actually doing good will be good for our business too because totally. you know good people will come and work with us so Absolutely. you know we feel happy and uh, fulfilled every day as well rather than just making money Absolutely. so um with that awareness already there it all it takes is basically you know everybody to share what good that they are doing mm -hmm. with the with the idea that we can together inspire more businesses so um thinking like that uh, is the key because it's not about us doing it alone but it's about totally. everybody to come together but they can have their own ideas and their own focus uh, you know issues like it, some businesses may be much more focused on education others care more about the health others care about the environment and that's okay it's not like creating good in the world it's also not one way or the other we really need to uh, make lots of changes uh, on the ground to really uh, shift us. So with that in mind, if we stop like judging and arguing or you know, dividing, if we come together with the appreciation of differences and the businesses are already different. There are so many businesses organically existing in this world because people are so different and they have a different creativities and ideas. Totally. and skills yeah so it's really about coming together now and if we don't do that um 
more and then quickly uh, for the next decade, then we will see uh, perhaps some difficult um, things as well. So um, we just have to keep going. Absolutely love that. Now, one, one thing that I really love about B1G1, compared to other organizations that do something similar, one of the mm -hmm. reasons that I myself and other, a lot of people are not too keen on giving to charities because a lot of what we give goes towards administrative fees. And when I talked mm -hmm. with Mr. Mm -hmm. Paul, he said that 100% of what someone gives uh, to B1G1 goes to, to, uh, to mm -hmm. the cause uh, 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 target. Yeah. Now, I want you to know, I want your feedback on that. How are you guys able to 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 uh, to to manage to get hundred percent of everything people people give to go towards the the actual cost? How are you guys able mm. to do that? Because that's <laughs> phenomenal. Um, so uh, actually, like when B One Job first started, we set out as a business, you know, mm -hmm. as a social enterprise, because we thought that everything we create, if we have some uh, great value for the customers or businesses you know, that we work with, then that will create uh, own sustainability rather than saying like, this is a charity, please donate to us. You yeah. know, because the aim is not to ask people to donate to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the aim is to empower businesses to sure. give to other causes, right? Like, so, mm -hmm. um, so we had that mindset, so, um, what happened was we decided to clearly separate the two parts of our initiatives activities. One is the membership side, which provide access to the uh, you know, innovative giving platforms and uh, access to impact accounting widgets, to access to you know, uh, uh, easy way to give uh, and share their impact. So B1G1 initiative um, has this like business membership program, which funds itself, right? Like, because businesses experience value, but in exchange, they are all contributing to this movement fund, which helps us to grow and scale this initiative. But at the same time, once um, businesses are working with us and start making giving, like doing giving to a particular project. So let's say $1 can plant one tree in many parts of the world, or even one cent can give one day's access to water. Right. Like, so when they make those contributions, um, if we took a percentage of this, <laughs> then that one cent doesn't go to give water <laughs> for a day. So we cannot take this. So separate um, entity, b one Giving, which is the registered charity, would receive the funds and they, they independently also set the criteria for the charitable programs. So we assess all of the project and, and charity organizations uh, and bring them on board. We do the annual review as well and the project breakdown. So um, when that happens, uh, we also top up the bank charges, like, you know, credit card <laughs> payment suddenly takes like little percentage off. So we, b one one social enterprise actually top up the funds at the moment to make sure that if $100 is received for the water activity or tree planting or education, then 100% of that gets passed on to the charity organizations um, we work with. Amazing. Love that. Awesome. Listen, we can talk for hours, but uh, we got to start uh, wrapping this up. Let me ask you now some, some final fun questions to, mm. to end this. Now, what would you say has been the best piece of advice you've ever received so far? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are many. And yeah, I think... Sometimes like it's not really advice, it's about the seeing and mm. experiencing. So maybe the best piece of advice or insight or thought or wisdom I received was when, uh, you know, for example, a family, uh, when I was backpacking and the family will invite me to come and eat with them. Wow. And then I go and then eat with them. And then I realized this family had very little you know, like they were sitting on the floor and there's no bed. Like they were just all sleep in the corner of the room at night. And it didn't look like they had much food to eat, but they were sharing that with me happily. And I thought at that time that I, I couldn't take that food because if I eat their children's food, then they might go hungry. Mm. And, but what I then realized was that when I accepted their offer to share their meal, that was the joyful moment for them. 
And that I think, you know, it's easy to give advice to anybody, but yes. that was like, not the advice, but that changed my perspective. Absolutely. Without them saying I should change. <laughs> it was like the universe and God almost teaching you intuitively a lesson through what you're seeing in front of your eyes. That's wonderful. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, what would you say has been the worst piece of advice that you've received so far? Oh, <laughs> maybe like a lot of them could be um, when I was in Japan, like mm. we believed or teachers said or adults said that, you know, we got to uh, get a good job and, <laughs> you know, we have to have these things. So you have to be, you, you shouldn't be too different from others because that will yes. upset others. Or <laughs> that, that. Kind, those kind of things. <laughs> get a job. Yes. Now, since you love traveling, imagine now you have a time machine and you can go back mm -hmm. in time. And you're, mm -hmm. if you were to able to go in time and sit with your eight, with the 18 year old Masami, what would be the number one advice you would give to her knowing everything that you know now? Oh, I would just say it's all okay. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, it's funny. I keep hearing a lot of, the, a lot of people saying the same thing. It's okay. Mm -hmm. You'll be okay. I love that. Wow. Now, do you have your own podcast? Sorry, my own podcast. No, or, or does I, B1G1 as have its own podcast? No, we don't. We appear on many podcasts, but we don't have our own. I think that would be something phenomenal for you guys to have to bring on the uh, the uh, the business you're helping. That's going to really help you guys get the word out. But now imagine that today you add your podcast, and today you have the most special guest, which is you're interviewing yourself. What would be the first question you want to ask yourself? Don't think too much. What is the first question that comes to your mind that you want to ask yourself on your podcast? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't make myself a good um, podcast host. <laughs> so imagine, imagine, you so, did, imagine today you're interviewing <laughs> you. What would be the first question you want to ask yourself? But the, I would be asking myself, right? Yes. What's the first question you want to ask yourself? Maybe I will ask myself. Well, this is the first question you want to ask <laughs> <laughs> then I can keep asking forever. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Ah, that's funny. That's hilarious. I love that. Okay. Um, wow, listen, it's been an honor talking to you. I love talking to you. I love your mission, your vision. And you guys reach already 260 million. And I'm going to be cheering for you guys doing whatever I can to help you reach 1 billion with a B. Let's reach a billion. And I, mm -hmm. and I told Mr. Paul, uh, personally that I would love to have another podcast with both of you together so we can reflect on, on B1G1 overall and all that. We're going to make that happen over the next uh, few weeks or so on, but that's something I would love to do. So, so listen, it's been an absolute honor. Uh, if someone wants to connect with you, Masami, what's the best way to do so? Okay. So if um, you are interested in the B1G1 initiative, then you can go to B1G1.com. Right, like, or if you forget to be one J one, then buy one give one, then we will still come yeah. up <laughs> on the search. And if you want to connect with me, then you can find me on LinkedIn. All right, awesome. I'll put the, the show notes on uh, the links on the show notes. So listen, absolute honor talking to you. You're mm -hmm. a true angel. You're a true leader with a heart. You're a true enlightened soul. Keep shining your light. Keep blessing the world with your presence and with what uh, the amazing good B one G one is doing around the world. Stay safe. Stay awesome. God bless, my friend. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.